Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now it's good to see you here in the auditorium in the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. It's a beautiful Lord's Day. God's given us to worship and the first day in the new year. And while you've been in God's house on the first Sunday in the new year, I want to commend you for it. And I hope you'll be faithful throughout the year and be found in God's house when you should be. It may be the last year we'll have a chance to serve God. Who knows? It may be the year when 1986 would be on your grave marker. Who knows? Or on mine. We just don't know. It pays to serve the Lord, and I hope you'll be faithful in doing so. You that are listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping we can be an inspiration to you. Now we'll be taping the singing, music, and the message. It'll be tape number 211. Tape number 211. We send these tape out for a gift of $3 each. And the gift is used to help to pray our radio expense. May God bless you as you work with us in getting out the gospel. Now if you have your Bible today, I want you to turn to two places. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 4 and Hebrews chapter 11. I'm speaking on this subject, he being dead, yet speaketh. He being dead, yet speaketh. I'm going to make this statement or this request for a purpose. I heard the other day that there's someone that were getting up signatures to impeach Three so-called judges to overturn the conviction in the all-day murders. And if anyone knows about this or can give me information, I'd like to have it. I'd like to get all the signatures I can. I understand if you get a certain number of signatures, you can impeach these stooges, three so-called judges. And if there's any judges need to be impeached, they need to be impeached. I'll be glad to do everything I can to get all the signatures I can. I don't think I have any problem getting up quite a few. And if you heard that announcement on the radio about it, someone told me it was on the radio either TV, where I could be able to get in touch with the person that's getting this accomplished, then I'd most certainly be glad to get in on it and do all I can to help get these signatures because those men need to be impeached. I was greatly grieved last week whenever... Uh, two escaped convicts, one a cold-blooded murder, the other an armed robber, uh, killed a state trooper because he pulled him over to check him and they shot him, killed him dead, went to a home there, killed another man, took his precious wife, his automobile, started down the highway, and then killed her, then killed themselves. Now the reason I said that is this. If we had a judicial system that had any teeth in it, that cold-blooded murder had been put to death and that trooper and that man and his wife might still be alive today. You see what I'm saying? We've got to do something about this. We can't let it continue on. Maybe you, it may be your loved one next. Something must be done. And so you pray with us and work with us about this matter. I know many of you get tired of hearing me talk about things like this. And I kindly... Vowed I wouldn't say too much about it, and God got a hold of my heart and won't let me rest about it. I try not to say no more than needful, but it needs to be brought before the people and kept before the people if something's done about it. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4, and uh, rather Genesis chapter 4 and Hebrews chapter 11. Now remember the message, the music, the singing will all be on cassette tape, and you can get these tape for $3 each. Just write in and say, Preach Edward, send me tape number 211. Tape number 211. i get them in the mail to you. I have a list of more than 200 tape. Be glad to send you the list. I'd be glad to mail you this list. And if you here in the auditorium, you notice we have calendars left down here. We'd like to get these calendars out. We'd like to send them out to uh, you. They want to write in for them yet because we still have a few left. But you here at the church, take them and put them out someplace where they can be used. And uh, pray for us and write to us. You're in the radio listening audience. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. Now you turn to Genesis chapter 4. 
He being dead yet speaketh. We'll find this text in Hebrews 11. You know, we've heard about people they thought were dead and, and uh, then they came back alive and so forth. I remember when I was a little boy, the story was told, it's supposed to be a true story. This dear man had arthritis and he's been over double. And when he died, they couldn't straighten him out. They put him in the coffin, but couldn't straighten his body out. So they finally pressed him down and just pinned his body to the bottom of the coffin. And in those days, people set up a, maybe several nights with the dead. And it came the last night of uh, sitting up with this dear old man. His name was Tob. They called him Uncle Tob. And there's only three men came to sit up that night. And along about 11 o'clock, one of them said to the other two, he said, Brethren, if you go out and sit up here tonight, I think I'll be going on home because I'm one of the pole bears and I need my rest. And then uh, he left. About 12 o'clock, the second man said to the third man, said, uh, said, Well, if you go out and sit up here with Uncle Toad tonight, there's no need of both of us sitting up here. I was also one of the pole bears and I'll be going on home so I can get some rest for tomorrow. So he left. By one o'clock, the third man is sitting there about half asleep, and that pen came loose, and Uncle Tob sat up in the coffin. That man jumped up and said, Well, Uncle Tob, if you go out sit up here tonight, there's no need of both of us being here. I think I'll be quiet, like a streak of light, and he is out the door. Now, that's supposed to be a true story. I heard that when I was a little boy. That's no offense that I said earlier to anyone, but uh, that's, they, they say that's what happened. Now, in Genesis chapter 4, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was keep of the sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the first of the ground of an offering, unto the fruit of the ground, rather, of an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the first thing of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. It shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel my brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Now turn, would you please, to the book of Hebrews, way over in the New Testament, page 1301. And look at verse 4. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice in Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. By it he being dead, yet speaketh. Now notice the latter part of verse 4. You'll find my text the phrase, he being dead, yet speaketh. Said God testified of his gifts. Now I want to bring a message pertaining to this man being dead, yet speaketh. Now this man is none other than Abel, the second son that was born to Adam and Eve. He was killed by the first son, the man of the name of Cain. And so through Abel we find a lesson spoken to us. He being dead, yet he speaks to our hearts today. What Abel did, and the way God honored his testimony, is a great message to our hearts, and I want us to see that today because it'll help us. We find that he speaks about the very act of Adam and Eve, the lesson that he learned from his father and mother. Now, you know the story of how they sinned against God, disobeyed God, and then they found themselves naked, and they tried to sow fig leaves together, come up to that nakedness. And God came walking in the garden to cool the day and said, Adam, where art thou? Now God discovered them. They could not cover themselves up from God. And the Bible said God took the skins of, and made them coats out of skins. Now evidently, God slew some animals to do this. The Bible doesn't say that he killed the animals, but... It implies that. We surmise he did so because he took skins. Now God could have created those skins, but I think he actually shed the blood of those animals because of the typology we find in the Word of God. And so God took the skins of animals and he made clothing for these uh, two people, Adam and Eve, there in the garden and covered them up. 
And so there was the shedding of the blood. And then when Abel came to worship God, the Bible said he brought to worship the little lamb, sacrificial lamb with the fat thereof, of course he brought the blood, and they had a special place to worship. God started out in the beginning designating a special place to worship. God said to the Jews, whenever they went into the land of Canaan, that Jerusalem is the place you're to worship. In the wilderness, they worshiped at the tabernacle. In the Christian area, we worship in the local churches. And God's always designated a spot or a place where He wants His people to worship. And that's why you're here today. God's not changed that. God began this on the day of Pentecost and shortly thereafter when He established the churches through His uh, apostles and people. And from that time on to now, we're met in the church buildings to worship God. And that's God's place of worship. We call it the church, the house of the Lord. So this man Abel came and brought the offering to a certain place. And there he placed the offering. He had the lamb, the fat lamb, and the blood, which is the most important. And he placed that on the altar. And when he placed that on the altar at the place of worship, God was well satisfied with what Abel did. God accepted that. Now that was the only way he could approach God and God be pleased and that was through a blood offering. Now we find his elder brother came. And when he came to worship God, he came bringing the fruit of the soil. Now God had cursed the soil because of sin. God had put a curse upon the land. Cain ignores this fact. And instead of bringing a little lamb and the fat thereof and the blood thereof to the designated place of worship, Cain said, I'll come my own way and I'll bring an offering of the fruit or the vegetables from the soil, the works and toil of my own hand, the things that I planted and grew, I'll bring them. And when Cain came to the place of worship, God frowned upon it. God said, no, Cain, I cannot accept your offering. I cannot accept your worship. I cannot accept your way. The Bible said Cain had turned the way of, of Baal, of Balaam brothers, we find in the Bible. And God rejected that uh, worship, that offering. Now the reason God did so is because it did not come God's way. Now that speaks from Abel. Abel speaking to us today that tells us there's only one way in which God will accept our worship. And that must be through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You can't come any other way. Now the liberals, infidels, and modernists today that deny the blood atonement and deny the blood of Jesus Christ, they cannot worship God. God will not accept their way of worship. There's no people in the world today, I don't care who they are or what kind of religion they're affiliated with, they cannot worship God unless they come the blood way. And the blood way must be the Jesus way, accepting his shed blood, what he did through his shed blood on Calvary. So Cain came the bloodless way. He came bringing the fruit of the ground and he said, I worship God my own way. He was the first liberal or the first Pharisee that you find in the Bible. Abel was the first fundamentalist that came and honored God in the Bible and he was a person that was righteous. The Bible said he being dead, yet he speaks to our hearts. And he lets us know that the people that actually please God are the fundamentalists. Now don't be afraid of that word, fundamental. It means in believing in the fundamentals of the faith, believing the word of God as it is. Now the news media today and, and a lot of the liberals and infidels, they like to call those terrorists over in Iran fundamentalists and different groups fundamentalists and they don't know uh, whereof they speak when it comes to things of God. Now we're the fundamentalists that believe the word of God and the things of God. They may be fundamental in their belief, but their belief is not right. Now we must come the blood way. And so we find that Cain ignored that. He said, I'll come the way I want to. I worship God the way I want to. I was talking to a young lady some few years ago that backslid on God and she'd never been saved. I was talking to her about 
uh, being in God's house and worshiping God. She said, I have my own method and way of worship. I'll worship like I want to or wherever I want to, uh, indicating whether it be in the home beside the road or uh, anywhere in any place you wanted to. But she is dead wrong. You don't just worship God like that, just any place. God designates a place where you can worship. Now you can pray and you can get in touch with God. But God has a designated place where you come and worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now a group can get together and worship God. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst. And so this man, Cain, came the self will way in unbelief, in disobedience, and religious hypocrisy. That's where he came. And God said, no, 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 Cain. I can't accept your method or your way. And so Abel, being dead, he being dead, yet speaks to our hearts today. And he came the right way, the blood way. The, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin, the Bible tells us. And Abel came offering a more excellent way to come to God. Now his offering was an obedience to God's will. God had revealed something to him. Evidently, Abel very well knew and knew deep down in his heart that his mother and dad came back into fellowship with God only through the shedding of the blood of an innocent animal. God shedding that blood, clothing them, and brought them back into fellowship with him, but he expelled them from the beautiful garden and would not let them go back in. And of course, uh, we know that Abel, when he did that, he had to do it by faith. He came by faith, believing that if he would come the blood way, in obedience to God, he could worship God, and God would accept that, and God did. He had a willing mind. Now, if you don't have a willing mind, then you can't serve God. God wants you to serve Him with a willing mind. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Now, God doesn't want you to try to serve Him against your will. God not accept that. It must be from a willing heart. God doesn't want you to do anything for Him against your will. God, first of all, moves on your will. He wants you to be willing to do it as unto Him. And it will please the Lord. And God keeps the record. Now, this man Abel went out and no doubt in my mind, when he looked over his little flocks, his flocks rather, his little uh, lambs, he picked out the most healthy, the most beautiful, the most clean little lamb that he had in the flock. And there he took that little innocent lamb and carried out and took his blood and the fat thereof and went to the altar. And so he brought the best of the first thing of his flock. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 26, My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. And so you must come God's way after you give God your heart by faith. Now don't serve God just because your husband wants you to. Don't serve God just because your wife wants you to do it or your parents want you to do it. Or don't do it just for someone else, some individual. Do it for God. If you don't do it for God, you might as well forget about it when you come to the judgment seat of Christ. Everything you've done will go up in a smoke, wood, hay, and stubble because you didn't do it for God. You did it for yourself or some other individual. It must be as unto God. And so Abel yet speaketh when he brought the little innocent lamb, which the type of Jesus Christ, God's lamb that came and his blood was shed for the sins of the world. Now notice some practical lessons here that we learn as he speaks to us. The Bible tells us he being dead yet speaketh that is, we're not to lean upon our own understanding and way, but according to His will. Now the Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is the way of death. There's only one way, and that's God's way. God doesn't have a half a dozen ways, and so He came in God's way to do God's will, and so you must come God's way. And if you'll do that, you can do God's will, no doubt. There may be some of you have in your heart right now a desire to know the will of God for your life in this coming year, this new year, 1986. Would you like to really know the will of God for your life? You can know it. I can give you two verses of Scripture. If you will read them over and over again, meditate upon them, 
take a good look at them. If you'll do that, they'll tell you what to do that you may know the will of God for your life. That's Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. You might jot that down on paper in your mind. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Those two verses will tell you exactly what to do that you might know the good and perfect will of God. Now when you find the perfect will of God, then you do it. You obey the Lord. Every true born again believer has a gift. You have a gift. God gives you a gift when he saves you. Now what you need to do is develop that gift. That gift that God has given you. God has given you a talent. What you must do is use that talent that God has given you. Now as you use the gift that God's given you, God will bless it and it'll be a blessing to a lot of people. And you can be stronger and become more powerful in the Lord as you do so. Discover your gift. You got it. Every true believer has a gift. Every born again believer has a gift. And you need to find out what it is. Get lined up and serve God and whatever your gift is. Now your gift is not limited to preaching or singing or teaching. Your gift could be many things. There's many different gifts in the Bible. There's the gifts of giving. There's the gifts of mercy. There's a gift of love. There's a gift of kindness. There's a gift of sacrificing. Oh, there's many, many gifts in the Bible. There's a gift of being faithful and serving God. God has many of them and you have a gift. And God wants you to develop that gift as you serve Him. So we learned this lesson from Brother, this brother Abel here, being dead yet speaketh. This man died. In fact, he was the first man that ever died on this earth after God uh, placed Adam and Eve in the garden. He was killed by his older brother, the first man ever born on this earth. Now remember, the first man ever born on the earth became a murder, the Bible tells us. And murder is of Satan, the Bible tells us. The Bible says he's a murderer from the beginning. And so Abel was God's child, God's servant. Cain was a servant of the devil. And he was a cold-blooded murderer. He killed his own brother Abel because God accepted Abel's offering and had rejected his. And he became very jealous and he didn't like it. And, and it made him very angry. And God said to him, God said, Cain... If you want to do the right thing, if you want to do well, you're not left out. There's a sin offering at the door. You take that sin offering and do what Abel did and you can be accepted. Now that sin offering was a little innocent lamb. And by shedding his blood, obeying God, he could have come also to the altar and been accepted. He wouldn't do that. And whenever he killed his brother, he is very stubborn, very hard-headed, self-willed individual. And he had his own way figured out. He was a Pharisee. He was a liberal. And so therefore he had his own methods and means. And when God came to him and asked him, said, where are your brother? He said, am I my brother's keeper? He knew where his brother was. He knew he'd killed him. We don't know how he killed him. The Bible doesn't say. He may have slipped up behind him, hit him in the head with a club. He may have choked him. We don't know how he killed him, but he killed his brother. And so we don't want to go that way, the way of Cain. That's the wrong route. And there's multitudes headed down that road today. And so we have the lesson from he that's dead and yet speaketh, that he came God's way by faith. Without faith it's impossible to please God. And he came to serve God with the very best that he had. Now God deserves our best, not our little leftovers. When God started out with the Hebrews in the matter of worship, God required that they bring a little innocent lamb without spot or blemish. It wasn't long after that until they would take the crippled lambs and the sick lambs and those that thought was going to die anyway and offer that to God. Well, that became something that God hated and despised. God said, you're doing wrong. They begin to give God their leftovers. God said, you farmers, bring in the first fruits of your farm and put it in the storehouse. And they began to bring in little leftovers. They kept the full ends and brought in the nubbins, as it were. 
and they gave God the least or the leftovers and not their best. Now, if God loved you enough to save you, and He did, and you're bought with a price, and God gave His best, shouldn't we do our best? Shouldn't we give God the first fruits? Shouldn't we do that? Shouldn't we consider God first and ourselves second or last? Sure, we ought to do that. You honor God with your first fruits of your income, your service, your ability, your talent, and God will bless you more ways than a country boy to go to town. But if you don't do that, you just drag your feet, do the best you can because God's not going to help you out. I can say that on authority of God's holy word. So this man, Abel, being dead, yet he speaks. He speaks about many things. He speaks, of course, about faith and obedience as he recorded in the word of God. He speaks about uh, being called righteous Abel. Now in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 35, Jesus talking about he that being dead yet speaketh called him righteous Abel. Now why was Abel righteous? He was righteous because he came to God by faith and believed in God and God made him righteous. The Bible said Abraham believed in God and God imputed unto him righteousness because he believed in God. That's the only way anybody can be made righteous. So he came by the way uh, of course of uh, being uh, killing the little animal and they're shedding the blood and coming God's way. That's the only way that fallen man can approach God is through the shed blood. See, Jesus said that he gave his blood, he died on the cross, and shed his blood and carried that blood into the Holy of Holies in heaven, placed it on the altar, and that's the only way any sinner can come to God is through that shed blood, that atoning blood of Christ. To deny that is deny the Bible. To deny that is deny the way uh, to get to heaven. Now you must come the way Abel did, by faith, with innocent blood as it were, Jesus being our lamb. You remember when John the Baptist is preaching by the side of the river Jordan and saw Jesus coming in his direction, he said, Behold, the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He pointed out Jesus, the lamb, and he was God's lamb. And he came as God's lamb. And he lived 32 and a half years as the Lamb of God. And he died on the cross, shed his blood as God's sacrificial lamb. Now the priests in the Old Testament up on that time had brought the lambs, there the blood of them, into the Holy of Holies every year. And for a year God would look over their sins. The next year he'd do likewise. The next year likewise. But when Jesus died on the cross, he once and for all took his own blood carried that to heaven, placed on the altar the tabernacle in heaven, and atoned forever and justified forever those are sanctified. And he doesn't have to go back there every year. He'll never have to go back there again to offer his blood anymore. And a person that's saved is sanctified forever through that shed blood. Now Jesus took care of that on Calvary. That's why Simon Peter said, we're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, received from uh, the vain conversation of our four parents, but by the precious blood of Jesus, a lamb without spot and without blemish. That little lamb that Abel brought, he being dead yet speaketh, was a little lamb without spot and without blemish. He brought that little innocent lamb. He had no sores, no disease, was not sick, not crippled, no bones had been broken. And then when he slit his little throat and caught the blood for the altar, it came out of a little lamb without spot or blemish. That's why when Simon Peter said we're redeemed, we're redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without spot or blemish. Now Jesus had no spot or blemish, no broken bones, no, no disease, no sores. Jesus was a perfect individual. Never committed a sin, never in a sin in his body whatsoever. He was a perfect spotless lamb of God. And then when he came to die, he was a perfect lamb hanging on a cross. And when his blood came out of his veins, the very perfect blood of God came. That was God's blood. And that perfect blood of God was carried into heaven by Jesus, our great high priest, and placed on the holy altar in the tabernacle in heaven and perfected forever every person that's justified. Jesus did that and took care of all the sins 
from beginning to the end, from Adam to the end of the millennium, for every believer that's born again. He took care of all of their sins, past, present, and future, through that shed blood. Now Abel speaks to us. He came speaking in many ways. He being dead yet speaketh. And he went to a better world. When uh, Abel died, the Bible says he went to a better place, a better world. He went into heaven. And Abel is now in heaven waiting at the altar of God. Many years ago, there was a little girl about eight or nine years old. She's walking down the street and she saw a gospel tent and she heard some singing. And she said, I would love to go in and hear that singing and hear that preacher preach. And she slipped in. She heard the singing. She heard the preacher preach. And then she went home, started telling her mother and daddy about it. Her dad was an atheist. And he threatened her. He said, if you ever stop by that place again, I'll beat you to death. A little girl later on that week, she just couldn't resist it. She came by and she wanted to be saved. And she went in and sat down. She heard the singing and the preaching and went out to the altar and God saved her. She went home and told her mother and daddy that she was saved, that the preacher preached about the blood of Jesus, how Jesus shed his blood on the cross for her. And, and she just couldn't uh, turn it down. She wanted to be saved and said, Jesus shed his blood for me and he saved me. Her daddy went and got a buggy whipped and he beat that little child. He cut gashes in her body. He blooded her clothes. And then she took seriously ill, contracted pneumonia, and she was about ready to leave the world. And she said, Mama, would you bring me a piece of my dress that's got blood on it? She said, Honey, what do you want with your dress with blood on it? She said, Well, I'm going on to be with Jesus. And the preacher said, Jesus shed his blood for me. I want to take that blood on my dress and show it to him and tell him that that was my blood that was shed because I accepted him as my savior. Mother placed that little piece of bloody dress in her hands. She closed her eyes and went home to be with God. Dear people, if you're not saved, you ought to get saved on this first year, first Sunday of the new year. You don't have a church home. Northside is your choice. You ought to come and take your stand here with us at Northside. You obey the Lord. You'll be so glad you did when you come to the end of this year I come to the end of life's journey as you sojourn. Thank you. You've listened well. Let's stand to our feet. Dear Father, we know he being dead yet speaketh. And he speaks about the perfect way to come to thee and to worship thee. Now I pray, dear God, that you'll use this message. That you speak to people in this auditorium as well as in the radio listen audience. Use it, our Father, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. David's going to play for us. Now listen, as she plays on the instrument, if you're here and you're not saved, if you die like that, hell will be your destination. You're just as certain to go to hell if you die without getting saved as you're listening to me right now. You ought to get saved. And then if you don't have a good church and never been baptized, you ought to join the church and follow the Lord in baptism because you're already saved. That's an act of obedience. If you like Northside, if you like our preaching, you want to join this church, come forward. We'll take over when you come. We'll help you while she plays. If God speaks to you to come forward for any reason, any reason, maybe I didn't mention, you come, will you? While we wait, when you come. If the Lord is speaking to your heart, come on. You and you alone know whether or not God is speaking. I don't. I hope He's speaking to hearts. But you know whether or not He's speaking to you. just another stanza Debbie I feel maybe God is speaking to somebody I, I wish you'd uh, make that commitment to God maybe you've been careless in your church attendance and you want to promise the Lord that you'll try to be faithful this year you ought to do that you're closer you're a year closer to the grave you were last year this time every day and every week every month brings you that much closer to that time 
you ever going to do anything for God, you better be doing it. We're approaching the end. We're approaching the coming of the Lord. We're approaching death. And you need to get right. How about it?